Assalamu alaikum. My name is Yusuf Ismail and the program you're viewing is I Beg to Differ. This is a program which focuses on socio-economic, political, cultural and religious issues affecting both South Africans locally and certainly looking at aspects of these issues in the international global climate that we live in. A few weeks ago, we looked at the pernicious scourge of human trafficking in South Africa affecting us both as South Africans and certainly foreign nationals that may be residing in this particular country. Today we relook that issue, look at this modern day form of slavery and with us in the studio to discuss this issue and navigate the way forward is Dr. Monique Emser who is the, an academic at the University of Kozo Natal. Welcome. And joining us again is Superintendent MS Ali from the Etikwendi Metro Police. Uh, welcome to you as well. Thanks. It's good to have both of you again. I just want to take you up on this uh, particular issue. Um, when we discussed this aspect a few weeks ago, we did make a distinction between um, the slight a distinction between human trafficking and of course human smuggling and I just want to clarify on that particular issue because I don't think it was amplified too much on the last occasion. What is the, there's a subtle difference between trafficking as we see conventionally and smuggling as uh, occurs across borders. Okay, so when we're talking about human trafficking, it's actually a process that we're looking at that involves three elements, which is the act, the means, and, and the purpose. So in other words, you're talking about either the recruitment, the harboring, the transportation, the buying or selling or leasing of a person by means of forced fraud or coercion, or by the abuse of a position of power or vulnerability for particular purposes of exploitation. So you can see it's a long, it's a long process. When we talk, and people have, feel that in terms of the means process, that they have no other viable alternative but to submit to the exploitation. And one of the key uh, mis misperceptions about human trafficking is that it has to involve movement or transportation. And it can happen in one location you don't even, and yeah, fix in a particular exactly. place. So for example, a grandmother might traffic her granddaughter for, for forced prostitution and the child's within the same home. So, so, so the, uh, the, the aspect of pimping or prostitution, it, does that fall then within the aspect of trafficking because you're under some yep. degree of control? Yes, it can. And when you're talking about human smuggling, that's across borders and where people have actually found smugglers and have actually said, I'll pay you a certain amount of money that's agreed upon that you'll smuggle me illegally over borders. And once that transaction's completed, that they've crossed the borders, it comes to an end. So there's a clear beginning and there's a clear ending. And that's the key distinction that we see here between human smuggling and trafficking. So can smuggling then, human smuggling, mm. where people cross borders, can that be done by consent? I mean, you get it with, with illegal immigrants entering the country, the scourge that's happening in Europe, the Zimbabwean nationals coming into this country, that can be done by consent, but trafficking is obviously never by consent. Yeah. It's always, there's an aspect of coercion, um, it, and, and there's an aspect of um, either psychological duress or violence, um, or it can be a combination of both. That would be the clear distinction. Now, I'm just looking at some of the figures that we uh, are focusing on, um, which are quite appalling. 51% of identified victims of trafficking are women, 28% are children and 21% are men, 72% of people exploited in the sex industry are women, 63% of identified traffickers were men and 37% were women, which is still quite a large number of women involved in human trafficking. Mm. And 43% of victims are trafficked domestically within national bodies, uh, borders. I mean, these figures are appalling to say the least, but it, it goes to show that it is, it's across um, certainly there's a higher proportionality of men that are involved in this as opposed to women. There's certainly a large number of women involved in trafficking other individuals. And how, how does this happen? How does the whole process, how is the process facilitated? Because it's just not one person, there's a whole range of individuals from the highest tier level right down to the bottom. Um, oh, well, this is a Trafficking, like we've mentioned, is an incredibly complex crime and there are different models involved. So what you're just talking about here is a highly organized model where you'll have a number of people involved w within the entire process. You may have a spotter, you may have somebody who transports... What's a spotter? Somebody who's looking out for victims, perhaps so, in a community. So this is a person that goes to malls and goes to uh, schools uh, and cites people that he sees as potential material potentially. for them to be trafficked, potential to be trafficked. Potentially, yeah. But it often, more, more often when we talk about spotters, it's, it often is involved in, in vulnerable communities or where you see individuals wishing maybe perhaps to move from one community or one province or even a country to another. 
So they're looking for individuals who actually are highly vulnerable that may be approached. When you say vulnerable, are they, are they poverty stricken or are they vulnerable in the sense of being children, being teenagers, uh, being easily susceptible to being brainwashed and controlled and manipulated? What are we talking about? All of the above. So, so essentially, you know, when we talk about vulnerability, I mean, vulnerability is something that's incredibly multi-layered. Um, so we're looking in terms of whether you, a, a child is vulnerable by merely being a child, for example. But then we look in terms of other questions of vulnerability. Poverty plays a role, aspirations of, you know, um, social mobility, social circumstances as well, substance dependence, for example. If we have foreign nationals as well, if they're in the country illegally, of course, the immigration status again renders them vulnerable as well. Um, children or individuals who may have come from broken homes or highly abusive relationships, again, we see that their vulnerability is, is raised. I'm going to bring you yeah. in, Mohammed, but before I bring you, just one point I want to leave you with, that when children are trafficked, um, no violence or coercion is needed for them to be trafficked. And as I understand, just bringing them into an exploitative condition constitutes trafficking. So, for example, when a child is taken and made to work in conditions of forced labor, um, slave labor, albeit for a short time period, mm -hmm. and then he leaves and goes home. That can be viewed as trafficking, as I understand. Of Would course. I be correct? Yeah. So, so Mama, just to come in here, is that as, as, as part of a, an affiliate, I, wouldn't, I don't know if you're an affiliate or can be seen as an affiliate or a, a two-tiered process with the SAPS, generally speaking, amongst the police, there's a lot of focus on trafficking for purpose of sexual exploitation with children, uh, made p child prostitutes, um, they're exploited by individual uh, bad elements and criminal networks, but very little emphasis is placed on people who are trafficking to labor exploitation. Labor exploitation, as I understand, maybe Monique can come in, seems to be um, uh, the more predominant form of trafficking as opposed to sexual exploitation, whereas the police seem to be more concerned upon um, sexual exploitation as opposed to those who are exploited for purposes of forced labor. Yeah, you see, Yusuf, uh, human trafficking, primarily what the police think is, it's only about sex, where sex is involved, sex slavery. But that's not the case, because it can pertain to organ donation, organ transactions, the way people are trafficked because they need a kidney, they need a heart, they need a lung, whatever. But that's under consent. People voluntarily give their organs, their livers, their kidneys. I mean, like we had this case some years back with the Israelis. Um, I can't recall the details of that. That can be done by consent as it well. It can be done by consent, but there's also a case of where people are not aware of, as Monique mentioned earlier on, people have aspirations. They want to move to a better country, a better location. You get promised, okay, fine, don't worry, I'm going to take you to Europe. I'm going to take you to South Africa. You come here and next thing you know, your organ is uh, taken away from you without your consent. How is that done? So the, it's done, they drug you. The fact that you're being trafficked illegally, the, the fact that you are being moved from one place to another place, it doesn't mean that it's by consent. You, what, ha yeah. what happens in trafficking is when a person is taken, the person is invariably drugged. The person doesn't know the whereabouts, where they are, what's happening around them. And it's too late. Them. Once a person, once a trafficker is apprehended, if at all, it'll be too late. It'll be too late. Can, it'll can be too late. You, you want to come in? The majority of cases, people aren't, aren't, aren't drugged um, in terms of that. They're groomed. Are they groomed? They're groomed. So how, how does a grooming process, because when you groom, then there's, this, there's an element of brainwashing that occurs. Would I be correct? Well, well I wouldn't go so far as saying brainwashing, but it's, it's playing again on people's vulnerabilities, their aspirations, for example. So we're seeing a lot of cases where friends are trafficking friends. Relatives are trafficking. How, how, do, how, do, how do friends traffic friends? I mean, explain that. So, you know, you strike up a friendship with an individual or the, the quintessential, you know, lover boy approach, you know, where you're luring pro someone with the promise of love, for example. So, you, you know, you're manipulating people's emotions, essentially, that you're creating a relationship of this trust. This is done online. Again. It can be on, online or, or in person. You know, and we've seen that in numerous cases where people have been then trafficked. They've either been sold on you know, to other individuals, you know, or left in exploitative situations. We've seen cases in this country where um, either close relatives or people known to the family, or specifically in terms of either engaging in an intimate partner relationship or even just a friendship, they've actually had been people trafficked with into forced prostitution or other circumstances, including um, forced um, drug trafficking. For it's example. frightening when you mention yeah. family members yeah. and, and how high 
is that? Is how common is that? Where family members traffic uh, next of kin? Quite, you know, that's it's quite it's you know it's quite prevalent. I would assume for monetary children. gain for the family member for the trafficker themselves. themselves. You know, for you know, there's, when we're looking in terms of trafficking cases, often we find is that somebody involved within the trafficking chain, or whether it's a small opportunistic operation, for example, involving maybe one or two people, we often see that that, that person is known to the victim, specifically where children are involved. Um, it's not all just strangers off the street, although this does happen in terms of how people are recruited. But there is some form of relationship that is, uh, is created that there's a sense of trust that's been built. And then the person is unfortunately then, then trafficked. And we do see this time and time again, mothers trafficking their own children and friends of their, their children. Mothers so, trafficking their children. Children. To who? To? To, to, to for example, to, to um, sexual predators. Um, you know, and the sexual own. predator then pays the mother yeah. um, for the purpose of the child well, being trafficked. Exactly. And, and, and is this transaction ongoing? Is this a continuous transaction yeah. perpetually where the child then is under the control of the trafficker uh, and the trafficker obviously, well, actually, it's, it's a t the mother and the sexual predator are both traffickers in this equation. Yeah. Would yeah. I be correct? They're, they're part of the trafficking exchange. They're part of the yeah. trafficking exchange. Yeah. 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 And, and I think, though, though, because we generally see trafficking as a kind of an organized a uh, conspiratorial syndicate, mm. but the reality is that it could be, you know, anybody that you could see on the street, someone that your next door neighbor, they could be involved in trafficking without you basically knowing. We have to just go for a quick short ad break and we'll be back shortly and we'll uh, touch on uh, some of the issues that you raised. We'll be back. <music> Welcome back to our Beg to Differ and with me in the studios are Dr. Monique Emza uh, from the uh, University of Kozo Natal and Superintendent Mohammed from Metropolis, once again back with us. You mentioned some frightening points before we went for the break um, and, and particularly in cases whereby you've identified the sexual predator and the mother as a traffickers and they are not necessarily affiliated with a, an international syndicate. But in that, in that particular instance, then the transaction would be very much of a private nature. There's no external funding coming from the predator. He probably pays his own money to the mother and she's part of this evil transaction mm -hmm. where the child is basically... Comes. How do you identify these particular aspects? Because it's much more easier than um, going after syndicates which can be seen and observed over a period of time. But at a, at a very minute, minuscule level, it's difficult to obviously identify. Well, yeah, that, that's what makes um, you know, trying to detect these cases so, so challenging for us. Um, because often it is, you know, if a child has escaped that situation and reported it maybe to a neighbor or, you know, in terms of a healthcare professional, that we come, you know, um, you know into, um, we become aware of it. So one of the biggest problems that we have in terms of understanding human trafficking is that it's not necessarily always just organized crime syndicates. There's a whole spectrum here of individuals who mm. may be involved. They may be involved for a short time or they might, might be individual small operations that have nothing really to do with this notion of, of gangs, you know, organized mm. gangs being involved or even transnational trafficking because in South Africa the majority of our trafficking is domestic and we see in terms of this is that you mean so, when you say domestic South Africans South Africans involved in trafficking involved not in trafficking. necessarily the evil Nigerians as people claim or Zimbabweans or Congolese or anything yeah. it's South Africans South that are involved Africans. In the this. majority in terms of we know in terms of detective victims the majority of our victims are being trafficked are South Africans and they are South Africans who are also trafficking victims mm. However, to, to mention that point that you brought in in terms of more organized syndicates, yes, we have um, transnational syndicates like Nigerians, like the, the Chinese tribes and so forth. And we often will see that South African traffickers will interact and form alliances, mm. one could almost say, with these individuals. But on a minute scale, where lots of exploitation is taking place, it may be in terms of domestic servitude, for example, trafficking for forced marriage, illegal adoptions, mm. um, and again, various forms of labor exploitation can be forced criminality, can be forced begging. You'll have more organized forms there specifically where we look in terms of forced labor, whether it's in agriculture, mining, textile. Oh, I'm gonna bring in on forced yeah. begging because yeah. I saw an article where Apparently, forced begging and these children that you see on the streets, sometimes they are part and parcel of a syndicate or a group of individuals whom they are collecting money for and are placed in that capacity. Mm -hmm. And we, um, out of sympathy or empathy, give these children food, give them sometimes money, 
but in fact the money doesn't end up with them. They are accountable to those who are controlling them. Mohammed, I mean, we, we discussed the issue, and I don't want to you know, belabor this whole point. We had Brigadier Naika um, the last time who um, <laughs> certainly expressed limitations in the SAPS, and certainly you obviously articulated what your position and well, what, what Metro Police's involvement is. And, but when, when, we, I, when we look at trafficking on the level or the scale that we see, that it's not necessarily these organized syndicates, but at a, at, a, at a very small level that it could be your next door friend, your next door neighbor within families itself. In those situations, it becomes a well-nigh impossibility to even detect the crime that is at place. Yeah, it makes it very difficult. And then the police can't do anything. Yeah, it makes it very difficult uh, for us as Metro Police per se. But uh, notwithstanding that fact over there, if we become aware of something like that, we can uh, inform the SAP, we can form a task force, liaise with people like uh, Monique to get advice on how we identify these people if they are really human traffickers. And we can stake out and we can do an infiltration, go in there and arrest those people. But the thing is, most of the time, as Monique said, these uh, human the, the type of human trafficking is domesticated. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, uh, the person that's being trafficked will not want to come forward to make a statement against the mother. They will try to cover up and try to hide it. But you'll have those one or two odd occasions where the child escapes and notifies the authorities, then we go in and we can arrest him. But, but, but mom, just, one, very difficult. just one thing, I mean, we, we speak about the difficulties there, but I'm saying even when it's clearly observable, just a few days ago, and you might have seen this report on the south coast in the Margate area on the main street. This is the main street um, on Sunday night at about 10 o'clock. You had someone in the Margate area that was busy selling body parts, body parts, a human hand, uh, a decapitated head. The individual was sitting in his car in the Margate selling body parts. And th the first time people heard of this was via social media. The police were not the first on the scene. The, the individuals that were on the scene were the private security companies that came and then the police came much, much later. And so I'm saying that if the response time, and this is obviously you're not involved with the SAPS, but if the response time is so um, uh, slow, then we've got an extremely uphill battle when we're looking at these other strains that exist in, in the community. I agree with you. We do because uh, response time is very, it's critical. It's very important. Like with us, well, I cannot comment on the case day in Margate. But with us here in Durban, if a case like that is brought to our attention, we have members on the ground. We have sufficient vehicles on the ground. We will respond. But invariably what happens, Yusuf, is if we arrest that person, the perpetrator, we're going to end up taking the person to SAP because we do not have holding cells. Yeah. So we do not duplicate functions. We'll have to take him to SAP, register the case, and then the investigation part becomes the SAP People arrested then by Metro Police are then handed over to SAP. The, SAP. the docket is obviously registered with the police, not with um, uh, the Metropolitan Police. No, not with the Metropolitan yeah. Police, because we do not have the holding cell but and we don't have the <laughs> capacity of investigating those cases because we do not have detectives. The but Metro then it's beyond police. your control. Whatever yes. what happens thereafter beyond our control. is beyond your control. I'm going to bring in Monique, I mean, will we see an end? Because this is good business. According to the International Labour Organization, um, forced labour alone, which is one component of human trafficking, besides obviously the sexual exploitation, um, as of 2016, there was uh, uh, an estimated that it, that it generates an estimated income of approximately $150 billion per annum. Uh, in 2012, the ILO estimated that 21 million victims are trapped in modern day slavery. Of these 14.2 million, that 68% were exploited for labor, 4.5 million, 22% were sexually exploited, and 2.2 million, that's 10%, which is small figure, but still a large number, were exploited in state imposed forced labor. Now, if this is generating such a high income, um, you're looking at profits of $150 billion per year. That's an extremely lucrative industry, it's a lucrative market. Um, and, and certainly it's sustainable. So what, 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 it, how do we overcome the fact that this is a lucrative enterprise um, and, and in your studies and research, how do you break down this dependency that exists? 
Well, it's a very interesting um, statistic that you brought up because the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes also, you know, you took that, that, that um, estimate and said, well, let's have a look in terms of how much we're actually spending globally in terms of global funding to combat trafficking. And we only spend annually 350 million US dollars. So, so the amount that human trafficking Many generates times. is far in excess than the amount of money that is spent by the United Nations and other bodies in terms of combating human trafficking. How do you, how do you overcome it? It's, it's well, impossible to overcome this. Exactly. And then if we look in the South African instance, unfortunately, we're highly unresourced. There's no specialized budgets to combat human trafficking at all. We have task teams across the provinces. They're unresourced, for example. So it becomes incredibly problematic then to try and address such a highly complex and organized crime. And this is one of the reasons why we, that we need highly agile you know, specialized task teams and so forth that can actually combat it. We need the resources, we need the capacity. We also need to train frontline or first line, you know, frontline responders as well to engage with these particular crimes. We need the support there as well as all the other government departments. We need the cooperation, collaboration that we vitally, vitally need across the board. You know, and we often work in silos, unfortunately, as well. So a lot of information is not being shared. Is there an underplay yeah. of the importance of this problem? I mean, amongst political parties, um, there's a lot of emphasis on corruption, crime, um, you know, land reform, all of that. Mm -hmm. But is there any emphasis on this? Uh, I, I mean, th th it's probably mentioned as a crime uh, amongst other crimes, but it's in fact more deeper than that and extremely serious. It's an incredibly serious crime because hu um, human trafficking is a manifestation of numerous other problems that we have in our society and numerous other offenses that we have. And the biggest problem that we often see is that, oh, well, you don't have statistics. You know, we, because it's a hidden crime. It's very, very difficult for us to generate statistics and compare it year on year because it, it was only criminalized, comprehensively criminalized in 2015 when the mm. act came into place. So we're still generating that data in terms of the scope and intent, uh, extent of the crime in the country. So for, for political organizations and, and other organizations who may be wishing to focus on other agendas, they try and discredit or downplay, you know, the seriousness of human trafficking and as a in specific this offense, I mean, yeah. as a specific offense, and working in the criminal courts, you don't see this offense in the courts I've been. Mm. You don't see this at all. Um, you go to the Durban Regional Court. Human trafficking. There's hardly a, sp a case of human trafficking. Most of the cases are individual cases of murder, rape, robbery, the conventional crimes that you see. Human trafficking is not on that list. So it's either one investigation is not being done, or two, um, the Department of Justice is not obviously. Uh, putting out resources in terms of where these crimes can in fact be prosecuted because I believe there have been a case a few cases here and there in Cape Town where the individuals um, have been acquitted because it's so difficult to in fact um, get the uh, you know prove that burden of beyond reasonable doubt that such an offense took place because it's so clandestine and, and that's a difficulty and challenge we face. Um, it, it, there's, a, there's a number of reasons why, we, in terms of the numbers, one of the biggest problems, um, like we mentioned, I think last time, is that the majority of cases that we're coming across, because we don't, we, we don't support proactive intelligence-led policing, we don't, you know, in terms of re resources that we require um, specifically to investigate human trafficking, is that we're seeing is the majority of cases that are coming to us is when there have been raids, whether they're on brothels or in, in um, various industries, and looking for other offenses that we're coming across trafficking victims. And unfortunately, sometimes when those raids are being conducted, those who are investigating them don't necessarily know what to look out for. Very rarely do we have victims at actually coming mm. to the police to actually say, I'm being trafficked. Well, well I've seen you a know. case, for example, in many instances which we had in cases of prostitution or where there's children involved, yeah. the children are in fact charged, the victims are charged, and in many instances for counts such as loitering mm. um, and, and so on. So you find in most instances victims that are involved in this exploitative enterprises are themselves charged, but the actual traffickers and those in control are not. And, and, and that's the dilemma we face. I just want to you know, leave before we go for a break. In early 2007, um, and this expands it to Labor, Labor Department officials conducted a week of surprise visits to homes employing adult domestic workers to inspect working conditions. The results of the inspections are unknown. Um, 
the government did not provide information on the status of pending cases that have been reported. The South African Police Service is a human trafficking desk within an organized crime unit, but the government to date has not provided information related to actions or investigations taken by the desk during the reporting period. I mean, this just goes to show that these units are set up, nothing is being done, no feedback, no report is given, so we can never be really sure whether any progress has been made in, in terms of this. Um, a lot of progress is actually taking place. Um, that's why we, we've got task teams established around, around the country yeah. in each of the provinces. Um, but unfortunately... A lot I'm of just going to have to stop you on that, on that point and we'll be coming back and I'll get back to you, Mohammed. We have to go for a quick ad break and we'll be back shortly. Welcome back to our Beg to Differ, and we're discussing today the uh, evil scourge of human trafficking. With me in the studios are Dr. Monique Emza and Superintendent Mohammed. Dr. Monique, before we end for the ad break, I did mention, you, you did mention, um, I, I mentioned the fact that um, there are these task teams that are set up, and sometimes we don't get the necessary reports, and you did mention that, in fact, um, there is some degree of progress that has been made at what level and by who. Okay, so we, we have provincial task teams around the country and that, that they're intersectoral task teams. So in other words, they, they include members of SAPS, DOJ, the NPA, for example, um, Department of Social Development, Department of Health, and as well as civil society organizations who are involved in anti-trafficking initiatives. Um, and they all work together very, very well in terms of this, not only in terms of raising uh, awareness, in terms of prevention activities, for example, educating the public, but actually addressing and investigating these cases. Um, so there's a lot of work going on and, you know, under the radar that's not necessarily being reported public to the to public. The media. But there's a lot being done, but also at a national level, the national policy framework is also being finalized and I think that will also give a lot more direction in terms of how that the act will It's all well and good and maybe I'm going to bring you in Mohammed but uh, you know and on that point that you raised but still you know and, and uh, maybe perhaps these are older reports but I'm told that the government of South Africa does not comply with minimum standards. I'm going to get back to you on what the minimum standards for the elimination of trafficking uh, and made in fact no significance despite the efforts that you suggest have been made um, a few years back, South Africa was placed, and I think I had raised this with Brigadier Naiko on the last occasion, and obviously I wasn't expecting him to respond, but South Africa was placed on the U.S. Department of State's Tier 2 list for a fourth consecutive year for its failure to show increasing efforts to address trafficking. Um, there was no actual information provided on anti-trafficking investigations that resulted in any form of punishments. And for the majority of uh, the reporting period, South Africa did not have laws that specifically prohibited trafficking persons until obviously recently. Government has a ro role to play in this. Government has a responsibility <coughs> to place. They've abdicated their responsibility in many respects, certainly with the, or, uh, perhaps they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed with the with the, the, the state failing at so many levels and within so many departments on a, at a dismal level? Yeah, you see, uh, the government as a whole, they do have a responsibility towards citizens. Mm. So they definitely have a major role to play in this. Funding, um, resourcing the police stations, all that needs to come from national government. The funding is there if it's being uh, but is it properly. is it coming? That's the point. Is it coming? That's the question I, I'd like to. And ask how do we determine? Also. I mean, uh, uh, certainly via the PI Act to access the information as to where those monies are going to. You can, but as you mentioned, not a lot of emphasis is being placed on this type of crime, and it is just like NGOs and people like Monique that focus on this, and they have their own individual task team. And uh, Me Metro Police isn't there a void within Metro Police? Um, I mean, besides obviously dealing with traffic offences and other aspects, but I mean, if this void is not being filled with the SAPS, surely there maybe could be an amalgamation between both Metro and SAPS in, 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 in confronting the scourge, or perhaps it's, it's maybe a shallow, superficial assessment from myself. No, no there, there is a huge void. The fact that we do not do the investigation of crimes and we do not get involved in the um, end results of the crime, our hands are uh, tied and uh, our functions are limited. But uh, very soon, there are talks that uh, Metro Police and SAP is going to amalgamate, and we're going to have one national police force. So maybe at that time, 
the status quo will change and then we, we will be trained in order to investigate these kind of crimes and we'll be involved in the front line of these crimes. But right now we are limited. So there's absolutely nothing you can do. Your hands are completely tied. There's nothing you can do at this time besides arresting possible suspects. Exactly. And it ends there. Exactly. So essentially transporting them to SAPS and then the, and the, then the rest is left to them. And then we hand them over for investigation and that's it. And that's it. Monique, just um, the, the issue of trafficking and maybe zero mm. in on some of the issues. Um, girls in South Africa, apparently, besides being um, uh, trafficked for purpose of commercial sexual exploitation, which is the, what, that, what the media, in fact, makes mention of, um, certain reports stated there's anecdotal evidence suggesting that South African children are, in fact, even forced to provide unpaid labor for landowners in return for their family occupying land or accommodation or maintaining labor tenancy rights. I mean, that's something new. Um, in, in fact, uh, the, the situations where you had boys from Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Malawi, they trafficked to South Africa for farm work, mm -hmm. often working for months in South Africa without pay before the employees have them arrested and deported as illegal immigrants. Now, how, how does, because that's not heard of, I mean, that, that I never knew until recently, that they're being exploited on farms. So how does that, how does that happen? And, and, and surely farmers then can obviously identify these trends that are in place, or probably they're not aware of this. It, this has been happening for many years. It just hasn't reached public attention um, because, as you correctly stated, media attention has been solely, almost, you know, exclusively focused on sexual exploitation. And in South Africa, as an internationally, we suspect that, you know, labor trafficking actually accounts for about 75 percent of cases. It's a majority. A majority. And, yeah. and, and the, the, the focus is on the actual lesser percentage of sexual exploitation as opposed to this. This was traditionally, but that has a lot to do with the way prior to the Prevention and Combating t uh, Trafficking in Persons Act coming into effect, because prior to 2015, we didn't have comprehensive legislation dealing with trafficking. It only dealt with sexual exploitation and child trafficking. But to come back to your particular point, we failed, unfortunately, for many years, and I, and I, I think it is a lot to do with a lack of awareness um, by responders about the significance of labor trafficking in our country, specifically child labor and various other forms of, of forced labor. How does it happen? How does it happen? I mean, because you've got a farmer in charge of, and, and, and he's got his laborers. So is there no connection? Is it dysfunctional communication that he's unable to identify this or is he fully aware and just simply turns a blind eye to it? Well, I don't want to paint with broad mm. brush strokes because you have to look at it on a case-by-case like, case basis, but we have seen in some cases the farmer is actually complicit. He, he is aware. He actually targets migrant workers, has them work for a season, doesn't pay them anything, and at the end of the season contacts the Department of Home Affairs and has them... And has them illegally you know, uh, uh, deported. deported. You know, for being you know, illegally in the country. That has happened, unfortunately. We also see in terms of this, that, you know, in terms of how large you know, um, uh, in terms of this operation might be, you might have other people involved in it and there might be a lack, lack of communication. But where children are involved, child labor, this may be taking place in very rural areas. It might not be commercial farms, for example. You know, it might be in terms of people sending their children um, to relatives for better opportunities and then- To work. To, you know, to work, you know. In terms of the sad reality of poverty that we do have in our country, it may be to work, to earn money for the family, then children are often sent. Um, or otherwise they think they're sending their child for better opportunities somewhere and the child is put to work and not given educational opportunities, for example. It's also, we see that debt bondage plays a significant role in terms of this, specifically if you're talking about migrant workers, they're coming over to the country, they're, or they're you know, working between provinces, and in terms of transportation costs, accommodation costs, they're accruing debts all the time. And this is keeping them in incredibly exploitative conditions where they're basically working for nothing to pay off these particular debts, and they, they can't leave that situation. And then sometimes we do see that may, if it's farm or other industries that are being raided, then they're summarily being deported, unfortunately. Are there any warning signs that we can see to identify this happening? Well, um, it's again, we have to look at what type of exploitation is taking place specifically. But is there free movement, you know, in terms of the person themselves? Uh, can they move around freely? Are they able to speak for themselves? Oh. You know, because there's often a sense of control that we do see here, whether it's financial control, psychological control, for example, and to a lesser extent, we also see in terms so of. So, if, if someone violence. wants to basically combat yeah. this or part of an mm. NGO, uh, if, if you want to combat trafficking, how would I know that that individual is being trafficked? I mean, are there signs, for example, obviously physical abuse, but sometimes there's no physical abuse as such. So if someone's going to school and he's being trafficked, 
how does a teacher in the classroom know that this child has been trafficked? What are the signs that he or she has to look at? Well, specifically with children, it it's, it's, you know, follows the same pattern if you're looking for signs of child abuse, essentially, you know, which most teachers have been trained on. Does the child's behavior, has it changed suddenly, you know, in recent months? Are they acting out? Are they being disruptive in class? Withdrawn, Born, depressed, rest, and so on. You know, not their usual selves. Um, is their classwork, you know, is their, their performance, you know, has that deteriorated, for example? Or do they have a lack of concentration as well? Are there other physical signs in terms of that they're acting out, for example? Uh, are they suddenly, you know, being aggressive to other children or are they withdrawing completely from, from class? Are they scared to make eye contact? But unfortunately, it's not always so clear cut where we have those examples because there have been cases um, that we have seen internationally as well where young girls have been trafficked, um, they're still attending school and they're being, you know, abused and exploited and nobody's really picking up on this because they're seen as being problem children. And trafficking amongst yeah. elder pupils, do yeah. you have a situation where elder pupils or older pupils within the same school could be involved in trafficking of a younger child? It has happened. And, where, and where peers have trafficked peers, yes. Peers traffic. Mm. How, how is that? So, how, how does that? How does the whole nexus um, work out in a situation like that? Well, again, that's where this whole notion of a creating relation of trust or friendship actually, you know, takes place. So, friends are trafficking friends. Essentially, we've had a case in South Africa where a teenage boy has actually trafficked other teenage girls for sexual exploitation. This has also happened internationally as well, where females. So he he, he yeah. gets them sexually exploited by other people, by other, other people. sexual predators, exactly. who pay him a certain amount of money. Yeah in respect to that. Mohamed, I, I'm going to come back to you on the next issue that I want to raise, but we have to go for a quick ad break and pay our bills. We'll be back shortly. Okay? Welcome back, and we're discussing the tragic scourge of human trafficking impacting on South Africans. Uh, Mohammed, before we went for a break, um, uh, one thing which I wanted to deal, and perhaps you may have had some involvement, how dangerous are these traffickers themselves? I and mean, when we're talking about, I understand that there's so many permutations surrounding this, when we're dealing with actual traffickers, and say for example you have an individual who's not affiliated with the police force, sees something happens, um, what's your advice to them? Obviously that they cannot directly go and confront. How dangerous are these individuals when you look at places like Point Road and uh, parts of the city center and Albert Park where these things, these crimes seem to be rampant. Are these really dangerous uh, syndicates that we are dealing with? Uh, yes, uh, a lot of people have the perception that uh, human trafficking only takes place in Point Road. Point Road hmm. is a notorious place, yes. There's drugs involved, there's human trafficking, there's trafficking involved prostitution. But human trafficking can occur, it can occur anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a gangster or a group of people. That's a stereotype together. that it's, people have. And that's I, a stereotype. all of us have that stereotype it can be, that it happens in uh, these... Without any this. reference to Dr. Monique, uh, Dr. Monique can be a trafficker. You may be sitting right next to her, but you may not realize it. It's a very clandestine, very undercover crime. It hasn't been exposed so much, and our policemen, including myself to a certain extent, have not been trained adequately on how to recognize a trafficker. Training in recognition, is that Training that in recognition, that's that important, that would help, that will assist the public out there. And you as an individual, uh, not a policeman, not affiliated to any security organization, when you see something like this, do not go yourself to want to go and stop the activities. Rather go and report the incident to a police official, to a police station. Go and report the incident. And, and the frustration that you have, because, you know, generally, w without that kind of evidence, you, 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 someone just cannot make a sweeping allegation, and then, of course, the, it might necessitate the need for search warrants. Um, you know, obviously, w just a simple report, from, from my experience, simple report to the police station, simply suggesting that something has happened at a particular house. Police don't just act or react in that particular fashion, unless there's obviously some degree of tangible evidence. And in most of these instances, you don't have anything tangible to show to law enforcement officials yes. to suggest that such a thing is happening. Yes, that makes it a little bit difficult also because you as an individual... The policemen are loath to just engage in raids willy-nilly without the necessary mandate as well. Yes, it, it makes it a little bit difficult because you as an ordinary member of the public, you don't have the time and you don't have the resources 
to collate and collect the kind of information or evidence that the police would require. They have the capacity, they have the surveillance teams, and they have the instruments to do that. So sometimes, again, when you go and report a crime of that nature, they are reluctant. I'm not saying all of okay. them. They are reluctant. Uh, what did you see? How many times did you see it? They want you to do some policing work, but instead of them rather coming and doing the Okay, Metro work. Police Department, and I'm just going to put you on the spot. How many cases of human trafficking um, in, in your time have you come across? Not one. Not one. Not one. So, so the suggestion made by you about this two-tiered process and working with the SAPS, it's very much of an arbitrary construct that in some capacity Metro Police will get involved, but in actual fact there hasn't been a single case where a trafficker has been possibly arrested or uh, apprehended by Metro Police and then of course handed over to the SAPS. And not to my knowledge. But if the authorities do ask us for assistance, we ever ready so and willing you need, to help. you need to be asked then, does the mandate have to be passed on to Metro Police to get involved in cases of this nature? Uh, not as yet, no. And do you not find that shocking that um, with the kind of overflow of this particular crime and the scourge of this crime being evident in major cities, and Durban is a major city, that Metro Police hasn't to date identified uh, one single case? Uh, it is shocking and then if I look at my mandate, we deal with 70% uh, uh, traffic related offences, 20% uh, crime and 10% bylaws. So if you look at the amount of time that we spend on traffic related in inverted commas, that takes up a bulk of our time. But uh, that does not stop us if we see something and we do our own follow ups because at the moment in Metro Police we are busy functioning as a fully, fully fledged police unit. So we do have our own surveillance team. We do have our own response units, so we can respond. But and we are governed, we are formed under the South African Service Police Services Act. So whatever our actions are, it's governed by the SAPS. When it, bringing you in and, and taking you maybe on an aside, someone who has been trafficked, certainly this is emotionally traumatic for this person. Um, depending on the age of the individual, they may not sometimes have been identified the fact that they have in fact been a, a part and parcel of this process of trafficking. How, how do we, how do we um, look after the emotional status of this individual once they have been taken off from the spider web uh, of having been trafficked? And how, how do you get them back into society? And, and um, you know, what, are the, what are the consequential psychological impact uh, negatively that it has had on these people or children for that matter? Well, I mean, human trafficking has a significant impact in terms of trauma. I mean, we deal often with, with victims who actually have gone through complex, you know, they suffer from complex trauma and complex um, post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. Stockholm Syndrome, is that, is that uh, have you come across that where a person doesn't want to be freed um, from the actual um, trafficker? Well, the, yeah, it's more common than a lot of people think. Um, and this is one of the problems that and we just see. Just define that for okay, those who don't okay. know. What is Stockholm Syndrome? So Stockholm Syndrome is also known as trauma bonding. So when a person's been trafficked um, and, you know, if they've been either, you know, physically abused or even psychologically abused, if their trafficker, one of their traffickers, um, does not, for instance, hit them, for example, they, they misinterpret that as an act of kindness. That, that person is actually out to look for them, that they care for them. And they, they generate this, this, this rather strange bond with the individual that they believe that this person is actually good. And one of the biggest problems that we see specifically with children or individuals, even adults who've come from highly abusive homes, for example, they may not know the difference. So when somebody acts that's not in an abusive manner towards them, they misinterpret that as kindness. And then they have a sense of loyalty to that individual. And we've seen that in innumerable cases, unfortunately, specifically when we're looking in terms of sexual um, exploitation. And this makes it very difficult then for investigators because they, they think that the victim doesn't want to cooperate. So the exploiter which, then uh, has this kind of bizarre relationship through manipulation with the victim with, that has been trafficked. Exactly. And then that victim does not want to speak out against. Is this a psychological, is this a psychological phenomenon? Um, where someone is emotionally attached. And th th is that emotional attachment only amongst 
women towards the traffickers or can it impact on men who are being trafficked? Um, I understand with children, but mm. can, can men also become or also be susceptible to this whole notion of Stockholm Syndrome? Of course they can, because, you know, Stockholm Syndrome, that, that whole notion came about, you know, with when, you know, people are kidnapped, you know, often and they develop a relationship with their kidnappers. And we've seen it in men and women and children. Uh, essentially, it can affect anybody because so it's a man is not is not is, is not homosexual, sexually exploited by yeah. someone who yeah. is um, uh, homosexual. Can he develop then that kind of Stockholm syndrome? And and because of this um, bizarre um, uh, position that he's found himself in. If you've been isolated, okay. If you've been isolated, if you've been starved, for example, um, if you've been beaten, or if you've been basically manipulated in various ways. Over time, your survival instincts kicked in. And also in terms of how you try to make sense of an incredibly unfathomable situation in terms of trauma that you'd be experiencing, for example. And it is a natural process in terms of what a person trying to psychologically protect themselves as well. And this becomes problematic for us when we try and take victims out of a situation. It's not in every situation where you see where we have this trauma bonding taking place, but it does occur. Um, and also we often see as well is that because of the complex trauma that they've been exposed to is that individuals who have been extricated from these trafficking situations, whether it's labor, whether it's sexual exploitation, they find it incredibly difficult to open up, to trust. They also have issues with memory loss. So in terms of when you're trying to interview... It's because your mind has clusters. Exactly. Just like in an accident, you can't remember immediately. So the trauma impacts on your mind and then of course you develop clusters where you develop a sense of amnesia, an amnesiac memory that you cannot recall the incident. That's a protectionist yeah. mechanism that the mind has in protecting you from that. Exactly, and one of the biggest problems is that we've, we've had to also train, um, you know, in terms of responders, in terms of investigators, is that the person's not necessarily being uncooperative. If the story keeps on changing, it's a natural protection mechanism that they've gone through. They can't, sometimes they can't remember, you know, immediately what is exactly has happened and what is the chronological, um, you know, process that's actually taken place. And it takes time to actually develop, again, a relation of trust because everything you've believed about yourself and the world around you has essentially been destroyed mm. through your trafficking process. So now you're dealing with complex trauma, complex uh, PTSD, for example, as well. And it's a very long and difficult process. And that's why we're very fortunate that we do have um, great organizations, specifically um, NGOs, you know, in terms of the shelters that they provide psychosocial support and working in terms of rehabilitating and also reintegrating people into society. Mohammed, is, is somewhat lacking that um, police, those in the police force don't have the psychological know-how in dealing or, or empathizing with victims of this particular type of, um, of, of, of situation? Yeah, true. I would agree with that. And, and how because do we overcome that? I mean, in terms of training, um, uh, police <laughs> focusing less on being too trigger happy and uh, em emphasizing a lot on, in terms of getting oneself mentally geared up in dealing with such cases. Yeah, we need to be exposed to more training in terms of human trafficking or any crime for that matter. We need, we need more training. And if uh, Dr. Monique over here can come in and explain to us, maybe come and see our head of Metro Police. Listen, this is the story. This is what human trafficking is all about. We would like to offer some of your officers training and I hope you're willing to accept it. Yes, then uh, we need the training. Well, what about training the, 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 of utmost yeah, importance? The problem that I also raise, and uh, we, we're going to wrap up shortly, local law enforcement officials believe to be connected with organized criminal elements that are engaged in human trafficking. Are you aware of that? Um, political figures, individuals within the police force? It, it is out there. In every uh, sphere of enforcement, there are corrupt officials. I'm not going to say all of them, but the few that's doing good, get painted with the same brush. And if uh, one police officer is identified as corrupt, people's, personality, people's perception, they will be straight, all policemen are corrupt. Last 30 seconds, your um, perspective. And if, if there was one, if there, as a law enforcement official, if there was one message that you would like to send out to human traffickers out there, what would it be? I would say uh, your time is limited because with all the ongoing training and with the resources that's going to be pumped into the SAP and Metro Police, your time is limited. Monique, uh, Emza, last 30 seconds, uh, last comments on this topic. I think we need to all take stock in terms of our own complicity 
um, as also private citizens in this country because we often fail to recognize that Unfortunately, we don't pay attention to the services that we use, the clothes that we might wear, you know, in terms of cell phones, in terms of produce. How is it being pro produced? Are we actually aware in terms of the situation of are people being exploited? So I think all of us have a role to play, even from a passive standpoint in terms of being consumers and actually, you know, looking in terms of how those goods and services were produced. I want to thank both of you, Dr. Monique and Superintendent Mohammed, thank you once again for joining me on this program, this very important program, and I think um, uh, it'll be important in the next few decades as well. Um, and we look to have you, uh, having you back again in the near future. Well, there you have it. Um, you've been watching I Beg to Differ. The program was on human trafficking, the follow-up to the initial program we had a few weeks back. And join us next week for more interactive debate on I Beg to Differ. This is Yusuf Ismail signing out on behalf of ITV. Till next time, Asalaamu Alaikum and good night. Thank you.